You may want to hold your applause until after I get done with the message. Uh, so that may be one of the rules. Uh, for family who are here, uh, for baptism, for other guests, for those who are watching online, uh, we are so glad that you are here. And really, you get to see what we're about. Um, it, we love that a father is the one who baptizes, not uh, a pastor or just a random person, but someone who spiritually has invested. We love families here, and so we uh, value that they would be able to see what it means for them to take those next public uh, steps of faith. Uh, but then also praying for our community, praying for our city. Uh, one of the things you should know if you're new to Capstone or just kind of hanging out for the first time, we don't measure success by how many people are sitting here on Sunday morning. We measure success by how our city is being transformed by the gospel. And so it's great that we have a full crowd in second service. It was great that first service was, was uh, crowded as well. But for us, if we have a thousand people, but our city is not being benefited by the gospel of Jesus, then we do this for nothing. And so we encourage you guys that make sure that your faith is in action, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, and if you could help us make room, Chuck, if you can move those things for me. Uh, yes, if you can find more seats, that's great. We are literally out of chairs. Uh, and so, hey, we should start a building program. Oh, wait, we're already on it. All right. Uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll be uh, seeing more about that. Uh, uh, I won't tell you that all now. Anyway, uh, I'm getting really distracted, so let's jump into God's Word. Here we go. Um, I'm going to have to cut a little bit because, uh, one, I talked too much in first service. Second, we got baptism. So I'm going to have to, if you did not watch last week's message, we would encourage you to go back to YouTube uh, or on our app or, or any of the things that you could go back and, and listen and watch. So we started this whole series called Balance and Boundaries, and we started in Genesis 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created. And the universe and the world was void and it was formless and there was no foot, there was nothing there. It literally says there was hovering over chaos. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one and the same, have always been, have always existed. Together they created. They made order out of chaos. And so we spent some time talking about uh, just even our galaxy. There's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And out of 100 billion stars, there's one. I say again, one star that has planets that have one planet that is a Goldilocks planet that is not too close, not too far. Its spin is perfect. If it was slower, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have life. If it was faster, it wouldn't have life. That if our tectonic plates were different, if our atmosphere was different, it's almost like God intended planet Earth to hold life. And in this planet, in this balance that God creates the universe on the macro scale of the stars and the planets and orbits and all the things that happen, there's also the micro that God created balance in us and that our lives and that our organs and all the things that make us work, that they have to be balanced to work. And so as we talked about that, we said that our God is a God of balance. That we even talked about Jesus and, and his ministry of, of his life and his ministry was one of balance and boundaries. And the Holy Spirit that dwells in us is one of balance and boundaries that continues to convict us and challenge us to make sure that we are living that life of Christ. So we ask the question of if God the Father is about balance and boundaries, if the Holy Spirit is about balance and boundaries, and all of Jesus' life is about balance and boundaries, then we as his church should be one who models balance and boundaries. The issue is, is that most of us, if we're really honest, our life looks just as chaotic and law as those who are far from the Lord. And so if, if we want to stand out, which by the way, Jesus calls us holy. He says, you are set apart. He says, you, the people should look to your life and go, man, there's something different. Hey, I know you play travel ball, but there's something different about the way that you guys schedule. Hey, I know that you're really active in, in the arts, but yet there's something different. I know you, you guys have two jobs and you guys go on vacation, but yet there's something different. Like there should be that our lives aren't necessarily that we could meet a commute, create a commune and we're just holy huddle that we all hang out together but that we take Christ as a light into a dark world and we put on display a life full of balance and boundaries. And so last week we talked about some of the myths and we don't have time to go into all the myths. I'll hit them really, really quick. It's just this, if I establish boundaries, I'm being selfish. We talked about the difference between selfishness and stewardship. The idea that boundaries allow us to create stewardship with the limited time, resources, and energy that we have. Boundaries are not being selfish. They are being good stewards. We said, if I set boundaries, I'll hurt others. We talked about, hey, yes, we may tell people no, and it may hurt their feelings. But it may be that God is using that no to, for them to walk in faith, for them to get themselves out of that situation. That Jesus doesn't help, he didn't help everyone when he walked on planet earth. He didn't heal everyone. And so the idea that, yes, we need to establish boundaries, and it's not the idea that we're trying to hurt people with boundaries, it's that we're trying to help them. 
And then third, but not least, is if I establish boundaries, is that I'm trapped. We said, and you'll hear this throughout the series, it, boundaries are not the idea that we're creating walls. We're not creating bunkers to hunker down in and hang out in. It's just protect all that's valuable to me. It's the idea that we create these fences, and these fences have gates, and we let the bad things out of our lives and relationships, toxic relationships, those bad habits that we have. We remove those out of our lives, and we open the gate to establish things that do need clearer boundaries. All right, and so we ended, uh, we ended with a tool and we're gonna hit on that again at the end because we want this to be very applicable. A lot of times we can go to church and just church gives you a lot of information about Jesus, gives you a lot of information about the Bible and those are, that's very, very important. But one of the things we value really, really much here at Capstone is it's just not about information, it's about transformation. And that's where we see, we believe our city is gonna be transformed, where you work is gonna be transformed, where you go to school is gonna be transformed, not because you know a lot of information about the Bible or about Jesus, about what you're supposed to do. It's the idea that he is transforming you from the inside out. That there is something inside of you that is being challenged and transformed in what he is doing in and through you. So today we're gonna talk about law of boundaries, the law of boundaries. So we talked about this book, uh, Boundaries, which is what this sermon series is based on. It is not a self-help book. It is a book that is uh, biblically based by biblical counselors. Uh, and so if you'd like to grab that book, I think there are a few more in the bridge. Uh, and if you'd like to, you can get that. And I'll go ahead and tell you there are 10 laws in the book. I'm only, hand, I'm only I picked three, all right? So if you get overwhelmed by three, don't get the book, all right? So you're like, I'll handle the three that was in the sermon and then I'll handle the rest later. So we're gonna just look at three of the laws that they talk about in this book and the understanding that uh, the world itself has, a, has nature, there are laws of nature. There's the law of gravity, which people are way smarter than me. Isaac Newton established that there's 9.8 uh, meters per second is the rate at which things fall. It is the pressure that keeps us from floating away into the universe. It's what keeps us in orbit around the sun instead of flying off into the universe. Like God established this law of nature. Then there's the law of motion, of motion the idea that some, once something is in motion and it stops in motion, there's going to be a repeated, uh, there's going to be equal and opposite reaction for every action. So there are all these laws in the universe that, again, God has established that make life on earth work. There's also these laws of boundaries. So what we're going to read, and especially these three, they're all based in Scripture. And so if they're based in Scripture, it's almost like God created us. He knows us. And he's like, hey, I know your tendencies. I know which way you're going to go. I know the things that you... So I'm going to give you these laws and be able to help you understand why you need balance and boundaries. So let's start with the first one. It's the law of envy. The law of envy. And the law of envy really is where it all starts. That the law of envy is basically what started it for Satan. So we, we talked about Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The first Genesis 1, God established balance in creating the universe, the heavens, and he created earth. He created the mountains and he created the sea. He created all, night and day. He created these, these things that work together. And then in Genesis 2, he establishes boundaries. He tells Adam, hey, I'm going to put this tree in here. You can eat of anything else. You can have everything and anything that you want in this garden except this one tree. Boundaries. Genesis 3 comes with the enemy, Satan, who convinces Adam and Eve that boundary isn't such a big deal. That God is just, he, he's trying to restrict them from living the, their best life. That he's just, he's not being fair. He's lame. He doesn't want you to have fun. So really, you just need to cross that line and do what you want to do because that's the best way to live life. Jesus told us in his gospel that the enemy is just simply, this is his game plan, to kill, steal, and destroy. And many of us in our lives, the, the, the scars that we have are because we listen to the enemy so many times, especially when it comes to envy. Because the enemy was, he was a created being. He was an angel, number two in heaven. He wanted what God had. He wanted the power. He wanted the relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He wanted that. But because he rebelled against God, that envy caused him to fall. The envy that he convinced Adam and Eve, hey, you want what you don't have. So you should cross your boundary. So whether it's Satan, whether it's Adam and Eve, whether it's us, the reality is this, is that we all have this root of envy that is within us. We're not satisfied with what we have. If you want to write a definition for envy, here's what it is. It's basically hating the things I have and loving the things that I don't. Hating the things that I have and loving the things that I don't. That's what envy is. And so when we, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have wants, you shouldn't want to upgrade your iPhone, you, you should want to, you know, get a nicer car. I'm not saying you shouldn't want things. You, we have desires and that's okay. 
But when our desires crash through the boundaries that we've established and we're willing to break those boundaries, that's when envy has ruled us. That's why I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get this. I'm willing to, to sacrifice all relationships in order to have that. I want to do whatever it takes because envy is what drives me. Envy is what drives me. So here's an example. Again, we always want to give you application. So say my, so say my thing is a lifestyle. Like I really want this lifestyle. I've watched these people around me and I want that house. And I'm willing to live in this neighborhood. And I want to look like this. And so I've, I've put that out there. My envy is what's driving me. So I'm going to work. And I have no boundaries of how much I will work. There are no boundaries of what I won't do to get that promotion. There's no boundaries that I won't place and put my work before my family. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna shatter all of that basically because I want this house. I wanna go on these vacations. It's the things that I don't have that I love, the things that I do have I hate. But in the end, because you lied and cheated to get that promotion, you still may lose your job and envy drove you to that. And I, I, you may lose that family that you put on the back burner just waiting for that next promotion because envy drove you to that lifestyle. You may lose everything that you have, quote unquote, this American dream because you go bankrupt because you couldn't afford the lifestyle that envy drove you to have. But if we have these boundaries, we begin to establish, hey, here's what I won't do. Here's the limits. I'm not going to sacrifice my family on the, on, the, on the measures of success. I'm not willing to, to go into debt for a lifestyle that I'm, I'm going to be content. So let's keep going in uh, Galatians 6, 4 through 5. It says this. It says, but, eat, uh, but let each one test his own work. Underline test his own work. If you have your Bible, if you have a highlighter on your uh, app, if you're following along on your app. And then this reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each one will have to bear his own load. Paul says, hey, you should test your work. Or here's what we might say today. Hey, you need to ask the why. What's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because you want something you don't have and you love the thing that you don't have and hate what you do have? That's envy. When you begin to ask the question, what is your motivation? Because if our motivation is envy, it's an endless cycle. It's the idea that our hearts will always be empty. It's the idea that I can never have enough. And whether it's money, whether it's success, whether it's influence, even the idea of quote unquote religion and church of righteousness, that I will never quote unquote be righteousness. If I, if I just want to be a good, 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 good person, I'll never be good enough, which is why Jesus had to come. That Jesus was perfect so that we didn't have to be. But they understand that we look to God uh, and when we begin to set these boundaries that we begin to go, I identif identify with who God has created me to be. I identify of who I've been adopted into this family. I begin to see that I'm not willing to sacrifice God and the commands that he gives me in order to chase after the things of the world. And we could, we could look at verse after verse after verse after verse that our lives are not meant to be compared, but to look in and go, man, here's where I'm thankful. Here's where God has blessed me. Here's where I'm thankful for what I have. Doesn't mean that I won't get a bigger house. What means I won't get that promotion. But here are the boundaries in which I'm going to operate. And in that world, that's where God does his best work. And it's not our power, but his, where we find satisfaction. It's the idea that in him, we find our identity. So we need to understand the law of envy. If that is what's driving us, that's why we need these boundaries to help us Say, hey, here's what I won't do in chasing after, quote unquote, the things of the world. The next is the law of sowing and reaping. I'm going to read uh, three verses. And really, we, I, could, I could spend an hour uh, about this because this is a theme throughout Genesis uh, to Revelation through the, uh, through the books of the Bible. So let's look at Proverbs 22, 8 up on the screen. It says, whoever sows in, in, injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then Galatians 6, 7 through 8. We just read Galatians 6, 5 through, uh, 5, 4 through 5, now 7 through 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the uh, will flesh will reap corruption, but whoever sows the spirit will from the spirit will reap eternal life. So here we begin to see that throughout Scripture we see this law of sowing and reaping. Now many of us know this. Many of us know that, and we've heard our we've heard people, we've heard wisdom uh, over the years. My grandmother used to say this. She used to say, "Hey, Walt, if you lie with dogs, you're going to get up with 
please, all right? All right, if you make your bed, you got to lay in it now. So the idea of that, both worldly wisdom and scripture tells us that you reap what you sow. And so we shouldn't be really surprised that if I smoke a pack a day of, of cigarettes, that I'm probably going to have not great health conditions. Or if I, I eat bad all day, every day, and I'm inactive, there's a good chance that I will be overweight. But there's the other side that if I sow and I, I have good habits and I set these boundaries of, hey, I'm going to bed at a certain time, I'm going to get this many hours of sleep, and that you wake up rested with less stress and good energy, And so we all have choices of what we sow and what we reap, of how we spend our time, going back to that stewardship question. And so these boundaries begin to help us to say, hey, what do these choices look like? That will I sow the things of the spirit or the things of the flesh? And when that helps us tell, hey, you know what? This is a thing of the flesh, this addiction that continues to control me, or this little thing of technology that I can't stop looking at. I spend more time on my fantasy football league than I do scripture, and fantasy football is coming up, so I'm going to start bringing that back into sermons, all right? Just FYI, all right? It's kind of conviction for some of us. But the idea that, hey, I'm going to sow, here's what I'm going to sow, here's what I'm going to invest in so that I can bear good fruit. Or will I bear fruit of the flesh, which in Galatians tells us, he says, it will reap corruption. He says, you can fool a lot of us at Capstone, you can fool your work, you can fool your small group, you can, you can fool a lot of people, but God is not mocked. He says, what you sow, in the end, you will reap. And so if your hope and trust is in Jesus, then that's what we're going to reap, is eternal reward, fruits of the Spirit that look like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Or we can reap the things of the world, which Jesus told us that the enemy is ultimately death to kill, steal, and destroy. And so what will we sow in our lives Because if we fail to establish boundaries, ultimately we wonder why. Why am I so stressed? Why am I so broke? Why am I so frustrated? Why am I so tired? Because when we look at the life of Jesus, if you're a Christ follower, you may not be a Christ follower. We're so glad you're hanging out with us. But if you're a Christ follower, our goal is to follow the words and ways of Jesus. Well, Jesus, man, he lived simply. Jesus lived a life that was full of rest, that Jesus modeled uh, boundaries and balance, and he was satisfied with what he had. He modeled the heart of the Father. He didn't chase after his own fame or his own success or even the quote-unquote American dream, but he said, okay, Father, where is it that you want me to go? Who is it that you want me to build a relationship with? I'm willing to do and go and be whatever you want me to be. Is, is, that, our, is that what we're trying to sow? Or is it, man, I want to get what I want. I want to decide what's fair. It's not that big of a deal that I cross those lines or do those things. So Paul tells the Galatians, look, the idea that you would listen to the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's some things you need to stop. So there's that gate in our, in our boundaries and we're gonna get those things out of our lives. We're gonna seek the Lord and say, okay, God, what is it that I need to begin to do to sow more for your kingdom than trying to build my own kingdom? What do we need to allow in? What are relationships or what are things that we need to change in our life? What are the habits? What are the boundaries that we need to establish to have to bring you into our life so that we sow the things of the spirit, not the things of the world. So we need to understand sowing and reaping are a big part of why we need or call to have boundaries. The last is the law of activity. Law of activity. So there, you might be here, and this is your first time in church in a long time because somebody hurt you. Or you might say, you know what? I used to be really generous and I used to help people out, but man, I got taken advantage of and so I don't help anybody else anymore. I don't go to church anymore. I don't trust people anymore because they hurt me. And so we become inactive. And so we build walls, which we've talked about. God's desire, especially if we're followers of him and worship him, is not to build walls to bunker and hunker down in, but it's the idea that we say, hey, how do we remain active in who he's called us to be? How do we continue to to bring forth the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? This entire summer, we looked at James in a series called Faith That Works. We looked at James 1, 22. Don't only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Again, we like to get a lot of information. We're hearers of the word. But the entire book of James is like, hey, it's just not that you hear it, that you apply it. The law of activity. It's that you just don't learn about Jesus, if we're Christ followers. It's that, okay, how do we put into play who Jesus calls us to be? And so how does that law of activity look in your life? This is what Hebrews 10 says. So the writer of Hebrews is writing, he ends chapter 10 and then goes into Hebrews 11, which is known as the faith chapter. He says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward for you. 
For you have need of endurance. Underline that, highlight that. You have great need of endurance. So that when you are done the will of God, that you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back. We're not ones who retreat. We're not ones who, who run away. He says, those who shrink back and are destroyed. But we have those, we who have faith, persevere their souls. So it's not the idea that we retreat. It's not the idea that we have inactivity. It's not the idea that we run. It's the idea that we, with faith, we continue to push back the darkness of this world with the light of Christ. That is what it means to be a Christ follower. It doesn't mean to come sit in church and check a box. It doesn't even mean to read my Bible so I know more information. It's the idea of going, hey, how am I becoming more and more like Jesus every day? What we say at Capstone is, is how are you closer to him today than you were yesterday? So what are those boundaries and activity that begin to go, hey, what do I need to change in my life so that I make decisions differently because of Jesus? That's how we define a disciple. Someone who is making decisions differently because of Christ. And if Sunday morning is your only difference, that's what we call a church goer, not a Christ follower. And in the South, we got a lot of church goers. And we lack so many Christ followers. So that's one of our, one of our mantras here at Capstone. We just don't want you guys to be Christ. We just don't want you to be church goers. We truly want you to be Christ followers. And we're going to push you and we're going to challenge you in that. Of going, hey, how, is, how are you living for him and making decisions differently for him? So when we have this balance and boundaries in our lives, we realize that we need endurance. You know why? This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Today, I believe, is marathon and Olympics. And man, there are people who are going to be running, you know, 24 miles. And it's the idea that you're going to need to persevere. You're going to need endurance. Because the thing is, is this activity isn't that you're just sitting and waiting for the Lord to return. We're just not going to Bible studies and just waiting. It's the idea that, man, we're going to be doing the kingdom work that he's called us to do. And so we're going to need endurance. We're, we're going to need boundaries. Because so here's what the boundaries do is that some of you got, quote unquote, burned out because you gave and you gave and you gave and you gave and you served and you served and you served and you served and you gave, but yet you never actually took a step back to rest as Jesus commands us to. Now, there's some of you and you say, yeah, I got burned out. And my response is, you were never on fire, so you never really burned out, all right? Because there are a lot of us that go, I'm just so tired, I'm so burned out. No, you didn't, never got on fire, all right? And so for some of us, we need to take back. And I, I kind of lean on the, I like to give, 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 go, 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 go. But the idea of going, hey, sometimes I had to step back. That's why I took sabbatical last year. That's one of the things I've been learning. God's been working on me is these boundaries begin to say, hey, well, you don't have to do everything. Trust in God more than yourself. And so I have to build these boundaries in my life of going, hey, I don't have to do everything. I can trust other people to do that. Or I, can, I don't have to make every visit. I don't have to do every little thing. And I gotta trust God more than I trust myself. So for some of us, we got to know this is endurance. This is a long game. We're playing a long game here. And so if you're new in your walk, man, you're so excited. You're doing all these things. The reason we have two services, if you're serving in Camp Rock in first service, we hope that you come and hang out in second service. Because if you're just serving, 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 then the idea that you're not going to endure, you're going to shrink back. And you're not going to be active. But hey, you also have to fill your tank up. So yes, we are called to live and we are called to love and we're called to be Jesus. But we were also called to sit at his feet and worship. So how does that look in your life? This law of activity of just not just going, 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 but beginning to build boundaries. Here's what I'm going to say yes to. Or here's the people I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve our high schoolers. And everything's going to be about serving in our edge student ministry. So I'm going to have them over. I'm going to have breakfast with them. I'm going to, and that's where my yes is. My yes is in our edge students. So I may not be able to help with other things. I may not be able to do um, some other things that Captain does because you know what? My yes has been students. Or my yes are our, middle, are our elementary school students that you see down here. That's my yes. And I'm going to, so I'm going to say no to some other things so I can endure with them. It's not the idea that we just come to church and we sit back and we shrink back. It's the idea that we push forward in faith. And that's what God calls us to do, to find that balanced life. It doesn't mean to stop. It means to find the things where to have the pace and endurance to do these things for the Lord. That's the benefit of boundaries. All right, so if you're new to Capstone, we try to give you a, a big idea. And then we're going to do some application to finish up. 
So here's our big idea that you can kind of process, uh, kind of talk through, post on social media. Um, but it's this, is that the law of boundaries are truths that God knows about us. He knows that we're envious. He knows the idea of sowing and reaping. He knows that we like to be lazy or we like to overwork ourselves and trust in ourselves more than him. He knows all of these things. So therefore, he commands us to create boundaries out of these truths. So how can I create boundaries so I'm not being envious and that's not my motivation? That I'm creating boundaries so I'm reaping and sowing things of the spirit, not of the world. How am I making sure that I'm saying yes to the right things that give me life and no to the things that are draining? There are some of the decisions I had to make. Man, there there are things that I really love here at Capstone. There are things that I love to do. There are also things that are are draining on me. And as we continue to grow and to continue to figure out, going, hey, what what are the things that Walt's really good at that gets life-giving for him? And then what are the things that we can empower and equip other people that's life-giving to them that Walt doesn't necessarily like to do? Because there are things I love to do that people are like, why in the world would you like to do that? It's like, well, that's the way God wired me. Like, I could not sit up here and talk to all these people. I don't necessarily do a great job at it, but it's what God's called me to do, and I enjoy it. And you're stuck with me till you find someone who knows how to do it better. Um, so you're stuck with me for now. So here's the thing, the balance and boundaries of going, how do I find this balance and boundaries? Not just go, 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 say yes to everything, but begin to go, okay, here's the boundaries in which God is telling me to operate. And your boundaries are different than my boundaries. I'm gonna give you some examples in a second of some choices I've made. And I'm not telling you, you have to make these choices, but these are boundaries for me. So let's start. I told you I was gonna offend a lot of people, so let's go ahead and start doing that. Um, so application. So we're, we're gonna go back to that tool that we talked about last, uh, last week. So the idea of creating this box and these boundaries, and there's all these things that some of you don't have real good boundaries on or something you're struggling with, some others, man, you have a great boundaries with these things. So we're gonna take, I told you to kind of begin to process, hey, what's in the thing that you got a real good job and then what's outside that lives like a wild feral cat that you have no control over and just chaotic in your life, right? We've all got them, they're all out there and we need to open the gate and sometimes bring them in and give them some boundaries. So here's an example, let's talk about money. So in 2023, the idea of this is, is a study showed that 70% of people are living paycheck to paycheck. 70% of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And that uh, 75% of those people have less than $2,000 of savings. If you're wondering, that would be called unbiblical. That God says you should not be slave to the lender. God says that you should be wise in your savings. God says, hey, you should be able to be generous. So tithing is generous, but if we're living paycheck to paycheck and I'm not able to tithe, I'm not able to do that, then there is a boundary issue in our lives. That we've got to begin to adjust some things because, hey, I can't be obedient in tithing. I, I can't be radically generous. I'm stressed out all the time because of credit cards. I'm doing all these things. And God's like, because I've given you guidelines, I've given you boundaries, I've told you how to live, but you've decided to go sideways. So let's just look at the three laws we looked at. So first, let's, let's look at our why. Why do we do what we do? So maybe it's you need to stop keeping up with the Joneses. The idea that I'm trying to purchase this or I'm trying to buy that and, and, and we need to connect with who we are in Jesus. So stop worrying about the rest of the world. Stop worrying what commercialism tells us, but the idea of who am I and be thankful that I've got my family, I've got our health. I've, we've got that little car that barely works. We've got that house, we've got those things. And then begin to say, man, I am so blessed. Because by the way, if, if that's you, you're wealthier than 90% of the world, that you are considered rich. So my envy is about what I don't have. And so I begin to hate what I have and I begin to love what I don't. But if we begin to build boundaries of going, hey, I'm blessed and this is who I am. This is what I have. And that's my satisfaction. That's where I'm going to start. Sowing and reaping. Maybe it's the idea of stop overspending. Stop buying things we can't afford. Because here's what happens. I guarantee you, if you continue and you don't get your finances in order, then it will lead to stress it will lead to debt. It will lead to fights if you're, if you're married. It's the idea that because of the stress that happens in that, that sowing and reaping is what's produced versus beginning to say, hey, how can I begin to sow biblically about finances? And I, like I said, I'm offending a majority because this would say that probably half of you are struggling with this right now. Half of you do not have this in the boundaries of where God tells us. So beginning to make steps to last activity. How, what is it that you need to begin to change in your life? Change your spending habits. Up there it says, what, how can I seek the Lord financially? So what scripture? What do I need to start doing? Maybe you need to start a budget. Again, our budget doesn't, it is, we know budget, budgets are bad. The truth is, is budgets are a good boundary. They tell us what we can afford and not afford. 
Or the idea that we need to stop. Here's what I need to stop. Here's what I need to get. Here's what I need to, you know what? I got a lot of junk. I can sell it in the next week and I can get $2,000 in savings and be way better than I thought I was. The idea of going, hey, this is an example of boundaries. Beginning to ask those three questions of the law. Man, is it envy? What's my why? What am I reaping? Am I reaping stress and debt or generosity? Or the idea of activity. What do I need to do to adjust to begin to get our finances in under here? And, and so we begin to think just like, man, this is the idea of what God calls us to do. This isn't just self-help. This isn't just, just the idea of good. Then This is what God tells us and shapes us to do. All right, uh, one more really quick is social media. Uh, I know nobody in here struggles with social media. Uh, I know, but the idea is this, is that some of you have social media going and that's like controls you and it controls your emotions. It controls uh, what you think. And so let's start with envy. Why, what's your motivation to be on social media? Start with your why. The idea that it, does it make you frustrated? Does it make you depressed? Does it, do you get the idea of FOMO? The idea of, man, here's what, here's what I don't have joy. So what's my why of social media, of beginning to look like that? Um, the idea of sowing and reaping. Again, you're consumed about creating posts in order to impress people. That, that you get disappointed when there aren't this many likes on something you've put out there. Or the idea that the people didn't comment. Or the idea of social media. So, that, man, I need, am I, is my identity coming from Christ or is my identity coming from a lost and dying world? And I expect them to tell me who I am versus who Jesus tells me who I am. And then the activity, again, that you would begin to say, hey, how is social media giving you endurance? Like, for me, I follow pastors, and I follow uh, things that, that, so I'm an Instagram and, and a Facebook guy, and so normally the people I'm following, they're giving me good things, and so it helps me, and so I, I, I bookmark scripture, and I bookmark quotes, and I do things, so that's why it helps me. Now, one of the boundaries I've given myself since my sabbatical is this, is I don't look at social media till 12 o'clock, till lunch. Because I found myself, and I'd never looked at it, you know, look at it maybe like eight o'clock or during breakfast while I'm eating, and I would just kind of get consumed, and, and, and five minutes turns into 15 minutes because I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And so I said, you know what? For my best time to work is in the morning, so I'm not going to look at social media until lunch. That's a boundary I've been giving myself because I need to be focused of what God wants me to do in the morning. Write a sermon, have conversations, email, write, whatever it is, is I need to be doing that in the morning, not looking at social media. So I put a boundary on myself to not look at social media. Some of you, as soon as you wake up, you look at what you missed out on, right? Before you thank the Lord for the day, you're looking at, you're looking at the FOMO, all right? Now, here's another thing. I don't, I'm not on TikTok. And the reason I'm not on TikTok is this, is people send me the ticky talkies and they send me the videos and here's what I have found out. So I don't really know the algorithm of TikTok and how it works, but you just can't watch one video, right? It's kind of like Lay's potato chips. So once you get one video, you're like, start scrolling, you start doing. So without fail, I would watch the video that was sent to me. It was funny or is a making fun of churches or whatever. And so uh, I would, but by the third one, there was normally a scant, scantily clad woman popping up on my screen. So here's what I did. I don't watch TikTok. I haven't struggled with pornography in decades, many, many decades. But you know why? It's because I put a boundary that I'm not even gonna let the things that are quote unquote legal lead me astray. It's easier to resist temptation than sin. And so some of you, your, your, your envy is social media driven. Some of the things that you're purchasing and your financial issues are social media driven. Some of you are so concerned with what someone says about you than what Jesus has died for you, then that's what you're allowing to control you. And this is why he says balance and boundaries are so important. Social media is not a bad thing, but when it controls us, that's the issue. Finances are not a bad thing. God says it's an amazing tool. Use it for his kingdom and his glory. So we're gonna, next week, we're gonna spend a lot more time on developing boundaries. We'll get some more examples, some more ideas of going, what is it that getting that you're witnessing? What is it that something inside of you that says, hey, here's where my life needs to be transformed by Jesus, not by the outside world. Let's pray. God, we thank you that, uh, again, it's not up to us. It's truly by the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to establish boundaries. And whether it's boundaries of time limits on social media, Lord, whether it's creating a budget for our finances, whether it's boundaries for family members and our work, whatever it may be, Lord, I pray that we would begin to ask the question, God, where is it that I need more balance? God, where is it that I need more boundaries? What are the things I need to say yes to? God, what are the things I need to say no? And, and we all have different responses that each one of us have a different struggle. Each one of us have a different story. And I believe that each story is about your glory. 
And so I pray that if there's someone struggling here today, God, that you would give them hope. If there's someone here who doesn't know you, they've come here seeking you, that I pray that they have found you and they've heard the gospel, seen the gospel and experienced the gospel. And they would accept that free gift of salvation. Lord, if I've described somebody's life of chaos due to the fact of lack of boundaries and balance, Lord, I pray that they would talk to me or others, that we'd be able to help them begin to establish what it looks like to have balance and boundaries. But God, it's not under our own power, as Hebrews 10 tells us, that we need this endurance. We need the Holy Spirit. We need gospel community. We need each other. For your, your plan for us is to worship you. You love us unconditionally, Lord. And you've set these boundaries, not because you want something from us, God, but you desire something for us in a relationship and the way that we can bring the kingdom on earth is in heaven. Your son's holy name we pray. Amen.